So you got to see the consequences of prioritizing safety over truth and trust and openness. And you got to see the harshness of the reality of your consequences, everything you've lost in your life, everything you've not attained in your life. That is because of this fear-based idea that you are vulnerable, and by you making that more valuable than why you came to fucking Earth. So my question is um, about anger. Is it um, is it anger a um, mechanism that helps me not feel so vulnerable? And the underlying desire for me is, and uh, uh, the underlying desire under this question is to to get over my anger issues. Great. I would say anger largely has two causes or reasons. And obviously we can narrow this down further and further, but essentially the first would be in accordance with what I just wrote. So that would be as a strategy, this is the gremlin's way of thinking that it's trying to be tactical. It's trying to strategize. It's trying to navigate the situation. But its fuel, its intended goal is to get to greater safety or to protect itself from loss of safety. But safety can be perceived in many ways. Essentially, if we go a little broader, it's perceived benefit. But specifically, let's take the angle of safety because it's very closely related. When we feel safe as a dual being, then we perceive that as beneficial. So we're always strategizing in the direction that we believe, that we perceive, that we interpret, that we define as containing the greatest amount of benefit slash safety. Now, if there's a situation, maybe your gremlin just thinks that anger is a good tactic to deploy frequently. That might just be part of its arsenal. That might be part of its reasoning, which can be changed. But so if a situation arises in your life that frustrates you, then some people are, everyone will deploy some strategy, but for some that may look like anger, for some that may look like withdrawal, uh, and then anything in between, fight or flight, essentially. What serves me best right now? Is it to fight, to get angry, perhaps? Or is it to withdraw, to let it be, to not say anything? Or is it some other form of communication or manipulation or navigation? So... The best thing to do is to fire our gremlin at the end of the day. The second best thing to do is to train our gremlin in ways that are more in accordance with the law of one. So pick your cherry. Um, the, so a situation happens in your life and your immediate response is anger because that's maybe your most well-trained tactic. That is what somehow your gremlin, your processing, your AI believes will gain the greatest certainty of benefit or safety. So then naturally your energies will go in that direction. It's a strategy, it's a reaction to something else. First, you can't get angry without a reason. Would you agree? Like you might have an angry temper, but it never comes out unless there is some kind of a frustration first, some kind of a reason. Nobody is just angry for the sake of it. And even those that are always seemingly angry and resentful, they have a reason for that. They have a, a, a cynical, painful, resentful view on life as a whole or God as a whole. or And therefore, they're always mildly angry. And sometimes it comes out when there's more reason or frustration. You follow so far? Do you agree? Yes, absolutely. So, and, and your desire with this question, before I proceed into more detail, what's exactly your, what's your desire? What's your intended goal? in this exchange what would you like the result to be i just wanna i like my desire before the call was to just you know ask you this question about anger <clears throat> and then somehow be vulnerable enough to transmute it somehow and then i was happy that this it fit kind of the topic of today it does huh? nice so perfect well let's just dive a little bit more into it then just examining the 
the patterns. And just by being vulnerable as you are, because you're asking a question, and shining more awareness on how this operates, this vulnerability compared, um, combined with your awareness of it, a, a renewed awareness, a heightened awareness, a clearer perspective on the whole thing, that alone should be enough to shift it. Maybe you need some power of will and decision as well, but you already have that because otherwise you wouldn't ask the question. So I think if we just talk a little bit more and you observe this as we're talking and dialoguing, then I think this will establish the result that you desire. But if not, let me know. So a situation arises and you can just think of an example in your life that's maybe somewhat frequent or regular or repetitive. Can you see that immediately you hold a perception, even before you get angry, like it's a nanosecond before you get angry, you have a perception of the situation, uh, a judgment, an interpretation. It's not just neutral or empty. There is some value, some assessment of threat versus value that's being given to the situation. There's an interpretation. Can you see that? Yes. What will really help you is to pause as early as you can in this process of getting angry <laughs> before it takes on too much energy, not to suppress it, just to catch yourself with awareness. Okay. Only suppress it if it's expressed to another being, but if you're by yourself in the room, by all means, like punch the wall if you want to, like let it at least let the energy go, right? As long as it's safe and it's not infringing upon anyone's free will. You could argue the wall's free will is a little bit damaged, but that might be a step too far because <laughs> the wall doesn't really care if it's a perfect wall or if it's a little dented, it's still perfectly wall from its own point of view. So no problem there. But if it's affecting someone else, then try to control your anger, try to pause yourself. But if not, don't suppress it, just let it go. Like if anything, breathe through it. Like, okay, no, okay, I'm angry. This is not ideal but I'm not going to judge it. This too is okay. This too is a beautiful energy. I'm just seeking something truer. I'm seeking a state of well-being. I'm seeking a truer perspective. That's why I'm frustrated. That's what this anger is. It's ultimately seeking for the creator. It's a positive in that sense. So you let it go through. You don't react it out onto anyone else, but you breathe through it. You don't suppress it. Just observe it as it comes. It's just energy, just energy. Feel the enjoyment of being angry again, without projecting it onto anybody. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. So to go back to the mechanism here, something happens. The first thing before you respond with anger, before your gremlin says, uh, 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 this go on, da, 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 da. okay, I got it. I got to be angry because this is what's going to get me to greater safety, or this is what's going to help me avoid say, uh, loss of safety. <laughs> before that happens, this is why it's nice to catch yourself early, to raise your awareness early, is you have a definition an interpretation, a judgment that you attribute to that situation. And you don't have to share it, but do you have in mind something that repeats itself in your life from time to time? So not just a one-off situation, but something that you're repetitively angry or frustrated with? Yes. Okay, sweet. So, so picture that scenario and see if you can slow it down because it's essentially it's a movie with a certain frame rate. Let's say it's 60 frames per second. The first, the first five frames of that second are spent assessing the situation, experiencing it, taking it in. The next 10 or so frames are spent on trying to discern if this is valuable or if it's a threat to you. You know, let's say it's, this is all analogous. It's a symbol, right? But within that one second of 60 frames. So the first five to 10 frames, let's say, it's just experiencing, just observing what's happening quite purely in many cases. The initial moment, you don't know yet what's happening. You're just aware, even though we do it unconsciously, but still there's sort of a purity in our initial observation of a new moment or a new story or a new scenario. But then very quickly, the next 10 seconds within this one quick second is now we're going to look for, okay, what about the situation? is threatening me, my safety, my benefit, what I think I want. And what about the situation is potentially valuable or an opportunity for what I want and for greater safety and, 
and benefit. And then the next stage would be, and this is where you want to catch yourself, is how you define that. So once you're on the lookout, once you're assessing threat value, threat value, threat value, now what's the next belief or interpretation or perception or interpretation that you give to what you're assessing as threatening, in this case, probably, what's the, what's the definition there? What's the judgment of that situation? Because that's the judgment that causes the emotional distress. And therefore, that's the emotional guidance system letting you know what you, what you interpret this to be is not what it is. You're misinterpreting it. That's why you feel bad. That's why you feel unsafe. You're interpreting it as unsafety in some way, shape or form, or as detriment, or as a threat in some way, shape or form. That feels bad instantly. And now we're all only like halfway through the frames, you know, 60 frames. Within that single second, this happens so fast. So we need to slow down this movie. We need to stretch those frames, 60 frames apart, so we can begin to, as we pause, as we slow down, we can look at them individually and see when is what happening within our process. We can't do this if we're just conflated with the ego and the gremlin, like this is who I am, but you just da, 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 da. That's like, you're on rapid fire and you're conflated. So we need to whoom, distance ourselves from the gremlin. No, first of all, this whole process is not you. You were a little child, you thought you were vulnerable and you invited in this little monster. Yeah, and it's also cute and sweet sometimes and it does what you want, but it is also a little monster in disguise. So you want to slow down your identification with it, create some distance, slow down the movie of those 60 frames so that this one second, what normally happens in a second, now you can look at it like over the course of two or three minutes. So what's happening there? I'm observing something purely, nothing is wrong yet. Instantaneously, I can feel my gremlin already being on top of the situation. What's the benefit in here? What's the value? What should I do? Da, da, da. Is this a threat or is this an opportunity? And then the next state, once it has decided if it's a threat or an opportunity of value, now the next level, the next frames come into being, which is the tactician. How am I going to respond to this? How am I going to act here? How am I going to feel and manipulate my speech and my thinking and all that and actions to make sure that either I acquire that benefit, the opportunity of value, or that I avoid or resist or reject the threat to my existing sense of safety. So you really want to slow that down. You can't do that when you're identified with the anger. So you got to make a decision now that the next time you're angry, you're going to not prioritize your reason for being angry, but you're going to prioritize this instruction. Think you can make that commitment to yourself? Yeah, I, th I think I already found like the lack beliefs uh, when you Wonderful. were talking. Yeah, it was Hit like, uh, yeah. Pardon me? Hit me with your lack oh, beliefs. Yeah. Yeah, so my lack beliefs that I found uh, while you were talking, uh, actually before, but again, was uh, nobody takes me seriously and nobody has my best interest at heart. And that triggers a feeling of vulnerability that I kind of want to escape by being angry. Or That's my assumption, my observation. Wonderful. And let's slow that down. I think you're on point. I, I think you are. But let's slow it down a little bit more. So say that again. There is either there is a situation that that seems to be evidence that you're not seen or heard or appreciated, or there's no situation, but you're just thinking this, right? You're just pondering or you're just like in a negative thought. So, but either way, there's a trigger. So you're either thinking about something or a situation reminds you of this lack of belief. And then can you say your lack of belief again and, and say it as slowly as you can? So I believe, or when this or that happens, or when I think this or that, I believe, or I feel triggered in the belief that... I believe that nobody 
has my best interest at heart. Nobody takes my point of view seriously. Wonderful. No, no, and nobody is a powerful component there. Because if it's just somebody like your mother or your father, or <laughs> it's like, whatever, that's just them. They're getting old, not, not going to change them. So, <laughs> but if it's everyone, if, if somehow through our life experience and our interpretation of that, we have internalized a belief, which always comes with a feeling that nobody has my best interest at heart. Nobody values my perspective, my point of view, and so on. Now that's a, that's a painful perspective because, and often that leads to more consistent anger issues or frustration because it's all the time, basically. You perceive that on some level, you believe that all the time. So it's really a self-belief at this point. If it's just one person, you can see that it's them, not you, right? But if it's nobody, then it's like something in our thinking, in our reasoning is like, oh, I am unworthy, or my point of view is not valuable because nobody likes what I have to say. <laughs> nobody has my best interests at heart. So this is, this is definitely a, is beautiful, I believe, and thanks for your transparency. And this is definitely something you want to transform because it leads to a consistent background baseline of resentment. Um, it can express itself differently in different beings, but it could be depressive. It could be, but in general, it will lower your energy. Like you will not be connecting very much to an optimistic, empowered state for the vision of your own life. The only way that you could do that with this belief system in place is by sort of becoming a rebel. And you see this in a lot of people. So they can be optimistic. They can be really creating a lot of things and, and being excited for their future, but it comes with a reactionary package. Like they're rebelling or oh, nobody likes me or nobody listens to me or nobody values me or nobody has my best interests in mind. Then fuck you guys. I'm going to go fucking do whatever I want. So then, okay, they can activate some passion and that's better that which borders on anger. It's a slightly different, it's a more constructive expression. Their gremlins are a little bit smarter, maybe, than your gremlin in this regard, because it's anger, but it's funneled in a more constructive way. Like, okay, well, then I'm going to be this, I'm going to do that. It's still not healthy, don't get me wrong. Don't go that direction. It's not smarter in that sense, like you should have more of that. But different gremlins strategize in different ways. And... And some tactics are more constructive and some lead to negative addictions and downward spirals. Others lead to sort of a sense of empowerment and creating something good. But all of them are a reaction to a pain belief, which means it's a belief that's not true. Otherwise, it wouldn't hurt. So when you personally assess a situation you're already coming at that situation, even if that person is well-intended. You're coming from a place of already not really believing that they have their, your best interest in, heart, uh, in mind or in heart, or that they're not really appreciating or valuing your point of view. Because you've already sort of anchored that idea in, you believe it, you're going to bring this as a background to every foreground, to every situation. And this is disastrous for relationships and friendships and your own sense of joy and your sense of vulnerability also, like being able to really connect with other people at a heart to heart level, seeing beyond the personality and beyond the physicality and into the soul and into the oneness and co-creating from a more spiritual place. Because the first thing that you need to be safe is to know and remind yourself that nobody has your best interest in heart. That's how the gremlin tech. Uh, strategizes. It's always trying to stay safe, right? So the gremlin is also afraid to lose a negative belief system. The gremlin is afraid to lose the belief system that nobody cares about your well-being. It doesn't want you to let that go. And it will try to distract you when you start getting close to seeing that this is not a true belief, 
It will try to sort of scream and shout and strategize its way into distracting you from reaching that point of resolution or liberation. Why is this? Can you guess? Why would your gremlin want you to hold on to a belief like that, that nobody cares about your well-being? If you remember that the gremlin's core motivation is to keep you in perceived safety, why would it want you to hold on to this resentment and this belief that people don't value your well-being or your point of view? Why would it not want you to let it go? Do you have any idea? How would it, how would it not serve the gremlin's intention to keep you safe if you let it go? How would it threaten its ability to control your safety? If you let it go. Well, I, I don't know. I don't know the exact answer, but what comes to mind is I recently had a new employee and then I let her go after five weeks. And she told me she's the only one who was loyal to me. And then, uh, you know, that triggered also this question. It's like, for some reason, her being pretty loyal to me, made me feel weird, unsafe or whatever. And, and I let her go again. So for some reason, I feel more comfortable with employees that hate me. I think that's yes, a, yes. Yeah. Beautiful. Well, it's disastrous, but it's beautiful that you're having this clarity. <laughs> so it's a good, it's a good step in the right direction. It's promising. Um, exactly. So, but why, what could possibly be the reason? that the gremlin, after a certain while of believing in something like that for so long, why is there now a fear to let it go? Like if I presented you with solid, hard evidence that many people care about your well-being and have your best interests in mind and are interested in your point of view, your direction, your leadership, how you see things, uh, what you're feeling, what you're going through. What if I could show you tangible, convincing evidence that this is the truth? And then what you have been believing for dozens of years is false, utterly false. Why would your gremlin try to avoid that piece of evidence or try to deny that piece of evidence or reject it or come up with other evidence? Why doesn't it want to let go of a negative belief system? Because it sounds silly, no? Like, why would it not want to thrive and feel, make you feel free and empowered and see things more clearly and have better relationships. Why, oh why, does it want to maintain this insistence that you're not loved, that you're not appreciated and so on? Why? What's the reason? What's the motivation? Well, it has a good reason. Um, and the reason is like a bad feeling and then the whole strategy was wrong the whole time. And it's a shame maybe to have been wrong Ooh. for 30 years straight. Nice. I love that. I think that's not the only one, but that's definitely one of the sort of structural support pillars, the sub beliefs that kind of help in cement and uphold this building of I'm unloved or, you know, I'm just going to summarize it as I'm not loved by others. Nobody loves me. So this house, even if you were to see that this house is not true, if it has enough support pillars, sub beliefs, reasons why it needs to maintain this illusion, then it will maintain the illusion. Because here's the simple mechanics of it. And I th I'm sort of paraphrasing Bashar here, but whatever belief you see through and realize it's nonsensical. Once you see a belief that you have, no matter for how long you've been holding it, when you see that it doesn't make any sense, you can no longer believe in it. However, and this is where we get to your situation, the only way that a nonsensical belief something that you've seen through, for example, Santa Claus is not real. You know, it's not, doesn't make any sense. So you can't believe in Santa Claus being real. 
But the only way you could then still continue to believe that Santa Claus is real, if you is if you have another belief, a supporting pillar, that in order to keep you safe, you need to continue to believe in Santa Claus. So then even though you, you know better, you know it makes no sense that Santa Claus is real and that he drops presents for everyone in the same night, like all across the world, it makes no fucking sense. But you will not let yourself get to the full point of conviction shift where you stop believing in Santa Claus and you're like, oh, of course it's nonsense. You will distract yourself. You will suppress that process if you have enough reason because of another belief to uphold this belief. Does that make sense? So this is great. Do you, okay, so question before we go further into this. Do you know, can you see that the belief that nobody respects or loves you or has your best uh, interest in mind, can you see that that's not true? Or do you, have you not seen that that doesn't make sense yet? So the primary, the first belief, the one that we're really working with here, not to support pillars just yet, but this belief that I'm, nobody loves me. Let's summarize it that way. Have you seen through that belief already? Or is it still something you actually are convinced of? I know it operates in you. I know you feel that energy. I know you have some of those victim thoughts, but if you look at it, do you really believe it's really actually true? Or have you seen through that? I have seen through it. It's bullshit, yes. Wonderful. Okay. So then if you've seen that it's bullshit and it's still, there's still some lingering patterns with this, you have some support pillars there that require that belief that they need you to maintain that belief. Otherwise you'll be even more unsafe. You'll be even more unloved or you'll be even more ridiculed. And you already mentioned a beautiful insight. One of them, I don't think it's the only one, but one of them could very well be, it probably is because you shared it with me, that if I accept, really accept all the way that this is a fallacy, that this is not true, then that means, this is a belief, it's not the truth, this is your interpretation, but that means I've been stupid, I've been a fool, I've been deceived, I've been so feverishly believing in this and relating to people from this background, I've been a fucking fool and I don't want to be a hypocrite or a fool or I don't want to be proven that way. So, because that would be what? Unsafe, right? The gremlin is there to protect you from unsafety. If it turns out by seeing through a stupid belief that has infiltrated your life in many ways, that's been part of your armor to the world, if that is accepted to be false, if that turns out to not be true, then that means you're, you've been stupid this whole time. You've made a fool of yourself. You've been living it wrongly. You've, you got it wrong this whole time and you fired people when you didn't need to. And you've caused relationships to be detrimented when you didn't have to, right? And that acknowledgement feels unsafe. Yeah. And I also feel like I, I wanted this to pay off this investment and this strategy. I wanted a big payoff day, you know, and it will never nice. come. And it's such a, you know, waste of energy. <laughs> yeah. Yes. What uh, what were you hoping the payoff would be? Like suddenly the whole world would recognize you? Or what, what would? Ultimate safety, like untouchability or something. Unshakeable. And how, and how would that logically, according to your gremlin at least, even though you, you know it's unrealistic maybe, but what was the gremlin hoping would happen by you holding on for this for so long? Uh, what would be that culminating release point? Like, what would that look like in terms of a story? What would be the payoff? How would that happen? Maybe people acknowledging that I'm right, that my point of view nice. is the correct one. Beautiful. Yep. So, my friend, you have exchanged. Here's what you have allowed. And don't be afraid to hear this. Don't be... This is not going to make you unsafe. This is going to set you free, but you got to see it. You have willingly 
ignorantly so, but nevertheless willingly, not out of an intention, consciously, but willingly, invited in a tactician. The tactician observed all the aspects of your life, your, your memories. And this AI program, which is very limited, but it's still pretty clever, it gave you a formula for life. It said, based on all of this, we're going to replace, okay, not replace, but we're going to cover over your natural bliss, your natural joy, your natural transparency, which isn't vulnerable. It's transparent. It feels good. It's connection. It's openness. We interpret that as vulnerability. Therefore, the gremlin comes into being. But then the gremlin says, okay, here's the formula for living based on everything you've been through based on everything you're able to do and not able to do and da, 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 all these elements. This AI takes all the data and comes out at your request. Your request is, keep me safe, guide me. It says, okay, I will. It reads all the aspects of your life, all your weaknesses, all your strengths and all that stuff. And it gives you a formula. The moment you accept that formula, which you unconsciously but willingly do because you want to be safe, because you believe you're vulnerable, which is not true. We can look at that. And now this formula, you're basically selling your soul to the gremlin, to your own personality. You buy a personality and you push your soul back into the closet. You have covered over, you have replaced your natural joy, your bliss, your clarity, your ability to relate, to care for others, to be cared for, to have natural exchange, connection, transparency, honesty, joy, optimism, alignment, connection. You have replaced all that with, I'm vulnerable, keep me safe and tell me how to do it. And you've, this AI produced this personality suggestion and you bought it. You bought it, you bought into it, you believed it, you bought into it, you purchased it, you bought it, you sold your soul. And everyone's doing this, did this. This is why we have to do this work. It's because that's what we've done. We have to retrace our steps. We bought a personality instead of being ourselves. Our natural, free, sky-like, stainless, fearless, transparent, activated soul. Our reason for incarnating. We sold our reason for being here for this package deal, this cheap little package deal of keep me safe because I don't know how. So you have missed out. Here's the truth. You've missed out on beautiful relationships in your life. Fact. It's absolute fact. You've missed out on many beautiful, valuable meeting points in your life that were designed by you at a soul level that had great potency, potential for expression, for expansion, for co-learning, co-creation, for benefiting the whole of humanity. You have missed a lot of these opportunities because you sold your true self for a personality, a structure, an AI formula for living, and you bought into that. Now you're starting to see through it, but you're still holding on to it out of that same weakness that purchased that personality to begin with when you were younger. So you got to see the consequences of prioritizing Safety over truth and trust and openness. And you got to see the harshness of the reality of your consequences, everything you've lost in your life, everything you've not attained in your life. That is because of this fear-based idea that you are vulnerable. And by you making that more valuable than why you came to fucking earth. You got to face that fact because if you don't, the gremlin's going to continue to give you reasons, to give you beliefs that make you think it's okay to sell your soul. You have to see for yourself that you're done with it. And then it's a simple seeing through it and you can't believe in it because it's nonsensical. But as long as you still have quite a bit of motivation to be seen as right, in your perspective, to use that as a trump card against others in your own mind, like at least I'm right. So therefore I'm happy, maybe somewhat in a way, 
in this perverted, weird, distorted way. But I'm scaring people away. I'm not truly connecting. I'm not truly opening myself up. I don't even know who the fuck I am anymore. What's a real emotion? What's actually being vulnerable? What should I be vulnerable about? But the fact that I've been believing this all this time, that I feel sad about it and oppressed within myself, is that authentic? I want to share love. I want to share light. I want to be seen. I want to see others. I want to live my life to the fullest. What, what does it mean to be transparent? We have forgotten. And in essence, it's so simple because it's what we are. So resell the second hand gremlin, sell it on the market, get some of your money back, some of your life force, some of your opportunities that were missed in the past, get some of that back. But mainly, live according to your soul, live according to your true essence. See through this idea that being right gets you anywhere. Don't die like this 30, 40, 50 years from now. Don't take yourself into your grave in a debilitating way. And it's great that you're opening up here now. This is an amazing proper direction here because you are prioritizing your soul, your truth, the clarity over your own bought into gremlin and the arrogance that comes with that. So that's wonderful. I hope that for starters, you can perceive greater benefit in being yourself, free of this resentment, free of this idea, this ideology almost, that nobody loves me. It's so silly. It is, it's so unrealistic, nobody loves me. Like if you say, okay, my mom doesn't love me, I could get that. Your dad doesn't love you, I could get that. My neighbor doesn't like me, I could get that. But when you say nobody loves me, dude, fuck you, because I love you. And I'm part of nobody. So you're lying. I know you're lying because I know I love you. So that's already fallacy. Like it's already not true. It cannot be true. It's so unrealistic. And then our gremlin gets this weird sense of safety and satisfaction from, well, at least I'm right. At least I'm stubborn. At least I stick with my guns. At least I'm principled. At least I know for sure, always, nobody loves me. Nobody's going to take that certainty away from me. At least I have some stability, some reason to be someone. I am someone who nobody cares about. That's who I am. Look at me, mighty and all powerful, nobody loves me person. This destroys the reason you came here. This wastes your life and you know it and you have been wasting it when you're coming from this idea. Stop wasting your life. I love you. Let's open yourself up all the way. Go in the direction of complete faith. And accept yourself as you are, meaning all the negative emotions that might arise, the little processes, the little purging of these sub-beliefs, these pillars as they get revealed. But make a declaration that this is not what you are. That this is no longer who you're going to adhere to. You can stop being a pervert. A pervert is someone who takes satisfaction and gratification out of a negative insistent belief system at the expense of their life force. That's a pervert. Let's not be perverts. Let's live according to the truth of what we are. Let's trust ourselves, accept ourselves, free ourselves, come clean into God. You know what's authentic, my friend? What's authentic is simple joy, simple freedom, simple openness. That's what's authentic. There's nothing about our gremlin processes. We can share that endlessly with people if we want to under the banner of look how transparent and I'm, I'm, I'm developing vulnerability and authenticity. But at the end of the day, all that is fine as an intermediary. At the end of the day, we have to learn to recognize what true authenticity is, what true openness is, what true transparency is. And it is as simple as resting in naked awareness in the presence of whatever appears. Staying naked in awareness, stainless, naturally, subtly joyful, sky-like presence. That's authenticity. Everything else at the end of the day is some formulation of the gremlin, is some perversion. So learn to really value simple, 
open, naturally joyful, at least open awareness. It gets more joyful as you practice. But practice authenticity by picturing the sky, just a blue wide open sky, and just allowing yourself to feel the joy in that, to see the sunlight in that, to feel that sense of open naked awareness. And begin to reframe in your mind that this is what authenticity is. It's simplicity. It's the purest, naked, most naked, barest, free, open awareness that doesn't look like any drama. It doesn't look like any emotion. It's the freedom of this moment, the openness of this very moment, of the nature of your consciousness, of your existence, of your I am, that's naturally interacting and sharing and radiating. That simplicity, the joy of being open, that's the most authentic state to share with yourself and others. How do you feel? I feel less tense uh, and I uh, feel, feel a little silly about, you know, being so vulnerable or feeling vulnerable. And what comes up is like the chapter about your the gremlin from your book. I think it helps uh, seeing the structure of the gremlin, which also already lessens probably some of the tactics of the gremlin, which Thanks. I look forward to. And then also what I learned recently is to always remember the 80-20. So not always think about the gremlin, but also, like you said, go into simple joy and stuff. Cool. Good. And silly. remember, silly is good. Silly isn't a negative judgment. Silly is actually part of the simplicity of naked awareness, seeing through a silly idea. At the end of the day, all ideas are pretty silly. When you put it in contrast to the simple, everlasting, ever-present, untouchable, stainless joy of sky-like awareness, compared to that true nature of yourself, any idea about yourself is silly. <laughs> so don't, when, when you see that it's silly, don't go in the direction of negative judgment, like, oh, I have been silly. Instead, see that that is silly too. Judging silly as a negative is super silly. Now, you might be tempted to then judge super silly as extravagantly silly, but that's superbly silly. So my point being, silly is good. Silly is not bad. When you see it silly, it's like something open, something cracks open and you start laughing. Something in you starts laughing. Maybe you're not at that point yet, but you can have a breakthrough like that by no longer judging, no longer fearing being silly, having been the fool about being so stubborn and insistent up and righteous about not being loved by anybody and all the missed opportunities and being serious and insistent about that, that defensiveness, that is silly too. And that silliness is a good thing because when you see it silly, you're starting to see through it. You're freeing it up. So by all means, see how silly you are. This goes for everyone. Not as a negative value judgment, but as a liberating seeing through of the nonsensical nature of these ideas. Silly, 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 silly. Silly Billy. It's good. You are silly. And it's not what you really are. What you are is free and beyond that and clear and untouchable and loving and open and already loved. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. I love you too. Yay.